Right, is that working? Yes, but nice. Okay. Hello everyone. Um, welcome to my talk. Today we'll be covering um Drupal Defense in depth, um, which will be a security framework for hosting Drupal at scale. Uh, and this is something we've been practicing internally um at Salsa on our own hosting product, Salsa Hosting. I just wanted to share our approach with you all. Um so on the agenda for today, um, so we'll have some introductions. Um we'll go through the five um key um phases um outlined in the NIST cybersecurity framework. I'll just wrap everything up. So as for introductions, um who's Ming? Who am I? Um I'm a DevOps engineer with Salsa Digital. Um I've been working with government slash enterprise Drupal deployments um since about 2020, um, mostly um with Lagoon. Um, I've worked in projects such as the Victorian government's single digital presence. Uh, I've been doing some Gov CMS work here and there. Um, and I also work on Salsa's Drupal hosting product, Salsa Hosting. Oh, something in chat. Uh, that's uh, Lee has posted a, a Drupal link, so I'll go to please go ahead. Um, so I realized I forgot to advance the slides. Um, so um, before we dive into it, we need to cover a couple of concepts. So our first concept is something called defense in depth. Uh, so what's defense in depth? Um, it's a layered approach to security, and it's traditionally composed of physical, technical, administrative controls. Um, however, with the move to cloud computing, cloud computing platforms, uh, the physical security layer is often taken care of by the cloud provider. Um, and it's not really something that us and DevOps have to be overly concerned about when managing our Drupal sites. So we'll really just be covering the technical administrative controls. Um, Salsa's defense and depth strategy consists of seven layers. So the first layer is infrastructure. Um, you know, the infrastructure, compute infrastructure forms the foundation of the entire platform, needs to remain robust. Uh, our container hosting platforms, such as Kubernetes um, on EKS or AKS or uh, GKE, um, ensuring the security of that origin host uh, prevents unauthorized access to any of our host applications. Um, of course, the application itself, uh, Drupal in this case, needs to be secure, up to date to prevent the exploitation of vulnerabilities and so on, uh, like you know, code execution, memory corruption, uh, edge protection. Um, we want to have edge protection as well via a web product such as Quantum Web, um, which will help and which will help detect and block potential attacks before they can even reach your application. Um, content delivery. Uh, you know something like a, a CDN, like Quant CDN, CloudFront, um, number of CDN products offers DDoS protection and traffic filtering. Um, and these two aren't strictly. Um, they're not. Um, the more the administrative side of things. So, you know, people, we need to have well-trained and security aware personnel um, that will uh, it'll help reduce the risk of incidents on your Drupal site, you know, someone falling for a phishing link um, and your process as well, you know, well-defined security process and a well-defined disaster recovery plan help you identify and manage risks associated with um, Drupal hosting. The next concept we need to cover is the NIST um, cybersecurity framework. Um, so it's highly respected and a highly adopted cybersecurity framework in the US um, and contains a five uh, contains five um, key phases. So that's identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Um, the NIST CSF isn't a certifiable technical standard, but it's highly flexible and it can be tailored to, you know specific tech specs and unique threat landscapes. So what's our strategy here um, for these two things? Um, we'll be aligning a Drupal defense in depth strategy um, with the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, why are we doing this? Um, so for one, defense in depth is an effective strategy to contain many attacks. If attackers were to compromise a single defense, the effective blast radius of their attack uh, will be limited by other layers of protection. Uh, the secondly is the NIST cybersecurity framework acts as a stepping stone um, 
to begin the journey to more stringent certifications. Uh, many of the practices and recommendations from the NIST framework are actually echoed in stricter standards. So aligning a defense in depth strategy with the NIST cybersecurity framework um, fortifies the layers of your defense strategy um, while helping to streamline the path to compliance for more advanced security standards like ISO or PCI DSS. So the first phase um, of the NIST framework, um, sorry, so I should also clarify. So for the purposes of this presentation, we're just focusing on these five layers, infrastructure, application, container hosting, people, and process, uh, because these are the things that most organizations usually have direct control over. Um, so infrastructure, well, we need to identify assets in our control that might be at risk. So some infrastructure components um, that might be targeted include uh, computing, computing infrastructure like web servers and worker nodes, in addition to networking components like network load balances. Um, application, um, the vast majority of vulnerabilities in Drupal sites come from uh, contrib contrib modules and themes and libraries. It's important to keep track of those that are in use um, and monitor the Drupal security advisories for any vulnerabilities that are disclosed. And we also need to be aware of, um, you know, what Drupal sites we have, um, like how many times have, you know, you received a support ticket or some sort of, you know, uh, obstacle escalation uh, for, you know, a Drupal deployment. And it's like, oh, I never knew we had that. Um, it hasn't been updated in like five years. Um, our container hosting as well. Um, parts of our container hosting or orchestration infrastructure that might be particularly exposed include the Kubernetes API server, um, as well as components of any observability stack that's in use, like, you know, Grafana or OpenSearch. Um, other cluster management APIs in use should also be considered. For example, um, if you're using Amazie's Lagoon.sh, uh, the Lagoon API, for example, is exposed publicly to the internet. Um, your people um, are an asset that might be at risk as well with the level of sophistication of phishing and spear phishing these days. Um, personnel are often the weakest link in the security strategy. Um, and your process, um, although it's not something an attacker can attack directly, uh, outdated processes are a risk that could negatively impact um, your implementation of later stages of this framework. Uh, so moving on to the protect phase. Um, so we need to protect um, our, our five layers. So um, starting off with our infrastructure, we want to, you know, try and leverage cloud provider concepts when we can, um, make use, make effective use of things like network security policy, security groups, uh, try and rely on things like cloud provider managed um, operating system images, um, because these are often you know, configured with best practice and are kept up to date. Um, we can also do things like regular rotation of our worker nodes to ensure that the OS is always up to date. Uh, this can happen manually via, um, you know, in the main maintenance window, or it can even happen automatically using tools like Carpenter, where you can set an expiration policy. So, you know, every seven days, for example, we'll find um, the node that's hit um, like a certain age, like 14 days old, old uh, drain it, kill it, bring in a new one. So it's got an updated operating system. Um, our application, um, so for our application, uh, we need to have things like configuration management and auditing. Um, ensuring that the configuration of our Drupal sites in line with the security policy. Um, Salsa actually has a tool for that called ShipShape that can monitor any running or um, any Drupal code base um, to ensure that um, all the exported config or the config in the database is actually in line with what the ops team or security team expects. Uh, regular and automatic, pat automatic patch management for core and contrib. Um, we want to do these as often as possible. We can make use of security modules like password policy, username enumeration prevention, uh, login security, the TFA module. These provide quite a few extra security features for Drupal. Like Drupal out of the box is quite secure, but um, these modules help build on that you know, good foundation. And finally, um, we also want to use static content um, if at all possible using tools such as Tome uh, or Quant CDN, which will generate a static representation of your Drupal site. 
uh, for our container hosting, we want to put sensitive um, endpoints like our API server on a private network, um, accessible only by you know a company VPN. We can do the same with Grafana and any logging dashboards. We can put it behind a VPN and further protect them with things like OAuth. Uh, we can use uh, an IPS to detect connection to to de detect connections to certain blocked addresses. Um, for example, someone breaches your um, your PHP container and deploys a crypto miner, and it tries to phone home using um, you know, a known crypto protocol. Um, your IPS can detect things like that, block them, and send an alert to your ops team. Um, and in a you know container hosting scenario, you usually have an ingress controller. You can implement things like mod security, which is an open source WAF directly an ingress controller, so that you know no matter how traffic gets to your cluster, if it bypasses the CDN or or if there's like um host header spoofing that gets through, uh, all traffic is um checked by mod security before it reaches origin, or at least you have some baseline level of protection. Uh, for your people, you want to have you know things like proactive security training, uh, role-based access control, Drupal's um, access control system is very robust with roles and very granular permissions. Um, you know, managing managing the use of things like password managers and two-factor authentication. Um, and your process as well, you should instate a security policy that enforces the standards listed above from things like your application configuration to network policies to user access, which will drive all these other layers. Um, our next phase is detect. Um, so on our five layers, how can we you know, detect a, a potential breach or an exploitation? Um, so for our infrastructure, a good way to actually detect anomalous behavior is your, um, your cloud cost and usage alert. So if your cloud use is fairly stable, um, you know, a cost and usage alert is a fairly useful identifier to determine if that's a breach, especially if attackers steal your compute by spinning up things like crypto miners. Um, Amazon also has tools like Guard Duty, which will actually monitor your instances, it actually scans your your volumes and monitors outgoing traffic to identify you know known uh, malicious signatures. Um, at our application level as well. Um, the login security, the login security module for Drupal is very robust. It can do things like send out automatic alerts when it detects that you know multiple accounts on your sites are having their passwords uh, brute forced. Um, also, things like uh, the security kit module can be used to configure a content security policy and a reporting endpoint. So, if someone does manage to you know compromise an editor account on your site and they embed you know like a third party script or an iframe. Um, They'll be blocked by the security policy. If the user browser will actually report the violation um, to your endpoint, so you know that oh, there's some uh, there's some content on my site that violates um, our security policy. And you can take action on that. Um, at the container hosting level, you can also ensure that logs from Drupal and PHP are aggregated and stored in a single place. So. Drupal can forward logs to a wide variety of endpoints through the use of community modules. Um, so the benefit of having centralized logging collected from all your Drupal applications is that your ops and support team can proactively create alerts and monitors for events that might indicate potential issues, breaches, or, you know, just general instability. Um, you know, people, people like content authors should be trained to spot unusual or suspicious content um, and be encouraged to report it, like, you know, no shaming here, like that was actually legitimate, um, but that's fine. But yeah, your your staff should be encouraged to report things they find suspicious. Um, same with emails. If they receive a phishing threat, they should be encouraged to report that. Um, and that's for process. You want to have as much automatic alerting and uh, proactive detection as possible um, by IPS, things like Prometheus, Elasticsearch. Um, open search can monitor you know metrics and you can create lots of thresholds to monitor for specific events and actually send proactive alerts to your ops team um the next phase we're going to cover is you know responding so uh, there's a pretty famous quote that I like it's not if you get hacked it's when um so we'll need to respond in the event of a security breach um and at your infrastructure level, since we're in the cloud, um, we can you know leverage lots of 
without infrastructure uh, concepts to respond to the attack. Uh, so for things like a DDoS protection, um, we can, instead of you know adding a web server rule um, and blocking the attack at the ingress control or nginx, which will place a lot of load on your origin infrastructure, you could uh, use things like a security group uh, on the load balancer itself to drop incoming attack traffic. Um, so the advantage of this is that this is this filtering is done at the cloud provider level on their hardware, so it's not putting strain on your web service and would alleviate a lot of pressure. Um, for your application, um, most of the time, if your Drupal site is you know pretty badly compromised, um, the only immediate response that can be taken um, is to just take it offline. Um, but if, if you've actually taken a static snapshot um, of your site beforehand using the tools we described earlier, it can actually serve as a pretty good fallback um, although like functionality for some very dynamic applications might be reduced, um, the site would continue to be accessible in some capacity as opposed to completely offline. Um, at this point, you'd also want to look at initiating restoration of backups while the static snapshot does its job of keeping your presence sort of there. Um, at a container hosting level, um, it's easy to ensure that your site can be restored to a known good state using things like you know container images which are immutable um, you can't change a container image unless you compromise the image registry itself um, also things like version control help with that so you can very easily redeploy restart your deployment and um, instantly your site's code is replaced with a known good copy that you know that you're sure you your devs have authorized and worked on um, that being said, your site's still vulnerable at this stage to the exploit that the attacker used to gain access in the first place, most likely. Um, we can use, make use of our centrally collected logs and metrics to perform a root cause analysis. Um, all staff should have clearly defined roles and responsibilities during an incident response. Um, like last thing you want is if you've replaced your site with a static copy and you're trying to respond to an attack and you know the content team is um, confused and they're trying to log in to try and fix things as well and they send in a support ticket um, and then ops is both trying to respond to the attack and also trying to respond to your support requests coming from in-house. Um, and at this point, all documented and hopefully practiced disaster recovery plans should be executed. Um, and the final phase is recovery. So as part of the recovery process at your infrastructure level, you probably want to recycle all your worker nodes and ensure they're updated to the latest machine image. Um, although containerization should have protected the host node, you know, better be safe than sorry, there's still a risk of container breakout. Recycling all the nodes will return them to their, you know, their original condition using the cloud provider's um, operating system image. And of course, before we can put our application back online, we'll need to make sure it's patched and updated so it doesn't get breached in the same way again. We can use information gathered from our root cause analysis earlier um, based on you know, collected logs to actually figure out how they managed to gain a foothold in the first place. Once that's done, we can bring the application back online or cut back from our static version. Um, at a container hosting level, um, we can retrieve the backups I described earlier. Um, using a centralized backup solution such as KitUp. So the advantage of this is that uh, the backups are completely decoupled from the application as stored off site. So even if they are executing code um, on your Drupal site and they have access to the entire file system, um, you know, they can't affect your backups because the backups are never on the file system in the first place. They're shipped off to S3 or some other blob storage and encrypted so they can't get to them. And you can know that uh, those copies are you know, completely safe, untampered with. Um, in terms of people, you should ensure that your staff are clearly informed about the cause of the breach. Um, there's no point hiding. Um, it's happened and, you know, this will just help people, you know, know what to look out for in the future. And of course, um, if you've identified any weaknesses during this whole process, um, you should make sure your plans and processes are, are updated to address any of these. Um, so in summary, um, the NIST cybersecurity framework is a great um, security tool. Um, we've applied the five steps in the framework across these uh, seven security layers or domains. Um, and let's start to 
it's time to for you to start defending your Drupal site. Um, hopefully this gave you something to think about. Um, the way we've broken down security domains and the five phases of how you can um the life cycle um, of each of these layers of your hosting infrastructure and how you can you know proactively apply um the security to them to ensure that you know your platform is as robust as possible. Thanks. Any questions? Damien has a question. Damien, yeah. Oh, I, I was just wondering on the, I think it was the first slide, uh -huh. you had about nine points. I was just wondering if there was a significance to the, to the order. I oh, know, so it was the fifth slide. Fifth slide. Yeah, I, I was think just I, wondering what the order is. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's um, it's numbered here. It's, um, it goes from you know um, let's see, how do I explain that? It goes from like foundation and we slowly build up from there. So we've got our compute infrastructure and we've got our container hosting platform like Kubernetes. We've got our Drupal application. And on top of that, we have our edge protection on WAF. And then on top of that, we have like our content delivery system. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that makes sense now. So I, I couldn't say that before. But... Oh, okay. Sorry, I might need to make it a bit bigger. Uh, but yeah, that, that number's on the side here. All right. Don't think there are any other questions. Um, yes, I mean I'm I'm open to feedback. What did what did everyone think? Um yeah. Any general or more specific? I, I had, actually I had a quick question. Mm -hmm. I probably did know this at one point, but spear phishing attack, obviously I know phishing, but what's can you what is a spear phishing attack? Uh, so Again. a spear phishing attack is, uh, it is, you know, it's conceptually similar to a phishing attack, like they're trying to trick you into something, but a spear phishing attack is very targeted um, specifically to, you know, your circumstances or your company. Um, so, for example, it might be instead of, you know, um, a Nigerian prince trying to uh, steal your money, it might be someone that's impersonating your CEO and knows that yeah. your CEO is currently on a business trip um, to, you know, sure. Japan. And they write, might write a message saying, hey, I'm on a trip to Japan. I need $5,000 very quickly. I'll pay you back. Um, you know, something like that. That's spear phishing. Thanks. Any more questions? Thanks a lot for the presentation, Ming.